This is the Extra Point Podcast from Arizona's family. All right, Saturday night, Mountain America Stadium. The Arizona State Sun Devils returning to action. They're pretty beat up this week. Uh, can they get a victory against a Fresno State team that we've been talking a lot about in the sports department? Of course, Julia, you covered Fresno State for a lot of years, and you have a lot of friends over there. So what's it, what, what do you expect when the Bulldogs come to town on Saturday night? I think they circle Pac-12 opponents on their schedule every year. They always step up to the plate, especially against bigger schools. I feel like they're always like the underdog mentality, and they always come in, especially with the Jeff Tedford head coach leading this team. Um, just make just they're gonna be ready to rock well do you have any friends that maybe we could talk to to kind of get a <laughs> scouting report yeah. do you have anybody in your rolodex yeah one of the best around okay. cam Warrell. oh he's here the oh he's Princeton right here State football yes okay hey thanks for joining us on the extra point podcast and uh tell us your favorite julia lopez story <laughs> man thanks for having me it's uh it's always fun talking to fresno state football yeah julia could have countless people from fresno join her on this podcast because she's beloved she's still beloved here people still ask about her oh you don't go on with julia anymore like julia's not here anymore she's gone she left so man it's it's great to see you julia um, I, I catch your stuff on social media like everybody else looks like super cool area to cover sports much better than i mean fresno state is it right there's no pro sports so Super happy for you, and, and uh, really appreciate you guys having me on. I appreciate it. Like, one day we're going to see Cam doing national stuff. He's, yeah. like, that good. Like, seriously, just, like, the way that you're able to break it down. He's the defensive mindset, able to break it down both sides of the ball. You're seriously, if you wanted to, you can go national. Appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate that. My, my best Julia Lopez story. Oh, Every, no. I would bring my daughter in. My daughter just graduated high school, which, you know, is kind of crazy, but – she played soccer. Julia grew up, grew up playing soccer. My older daughter played soccer, so they would exchange soccer stories. And Ari always felt she felt so cool going to the studio on Sunday night and getting to talk to Julia. So, yeah, she she's the best. Yeah, we have pictures of J Lo. She was in the paper in Albuquerque. I don't know if you've seen them. She's uh yeah. I, I think she was what the enforcer was that was that sort of the. Uh... Was that was that sort of your role? <laughs> basically, yeah, center mid, just take care of like the best player on the other team, and you know, shut him down. That was basically what I did out there in the corner kicks, which is awesome. But actually, Cam, you got to tell the story about your daughter, what she played through last season, which is insane. <laughs> yes, my daughter was going into her senior year last year. She was a COVID kid, so she missed some recruiting time and and had some conversations and some teams that came out and watched her, but no real offers and. Last uh, September in a club game, she tore her ACL oh, no. and, and was so determined to play her senior year that she rehabbed and she was like, I want to give it a shot. And we were like, okay, go for it. Like, just, it won't hurt. You're going to rehab anyway before surgery. So she got to a point where her physical therapist was comfortable enough with her if she put a brace on to get a little bit of action. And she ended up playing like 25 minutes a game down the stretch Clovis North won a section title her senior year which was the only reason why she wanted to play was to help them do that so it I mean it was I, I I didn't think it was possible honestly so to watch her go through that and you know put up with the pain and just continue to fight for her team you know she couldn't play to her regular ability but man Jeez. she busted every time she was on the field it was very inspiring to watch her go through that. Can you believe that? Wow. Basically wow. playing soccer on one leg. Wow. No, Literally. she's still playing. Did she get it operated on? What's what's the rest of the story there? Yeah, she had surgery in May after the season. So she's like three and a half months out rehabbing. She went to Fresno City, so she's gonna play. They're playing right now, so she's out, but she'll play play next season. So she wanted to continue to play and and Fresno City's a good spot, national champs a couple of years ago. So she's she's excited to return to the soccer field. Very cool. Oh, I love hearing that. You taught, yeah. Look, look at what you started, J Lo. The <laughs> love for soccer, and uh, it keeps going. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's talk uh, about the about the other football, the football <laughs> field on on Saturday night. What sort of Fresno State is coming? A team is coming to town. What should we expect from? Well, we know Mikey Keene. We we covered him for years here, but uh, but this team, what second longest win streak in the nation? Who who are these Bulldogs? Yeah, they're. Uh... You know, they were one and four last year and went on a 
went on a nine game winning streak with Jake Hayner and Jalen Cropper and Nico Remigio, guys who are all in the NFL now. So this is a new version. Mikey King came in from the transfer portal. Uh, Eric Brooks, a young receiver who had played a little bit, is the guy now. I mean, this is a team that, you know, they learned so much last season being one and four with the backup quarterback starting and fighting through making that run. They were down against Purdue. They were down against Eastern Washington, both in the fourth quarter, and they fought back. So this is a team that has belief in what they can do. They're not really phased by any circumstances. Mikey Keene didn't play a good game against Eastern Washington, but let them down the field. They kicked a field goal to tie it. They actually had a chance to win in regulation, missed a field goal, uh, and then First overtime, both scored touchdowns. Second overtime, Fresno State gets stopped, kick a field goal, and first play, Eastern Washington runs on offense in the second overtime. Fresno State gets an interception. So they're, they're a team that they're not going to be phased. They're not going to be phased by the big environment. I think they're really going to play elevated compared to how they played against Eastern Washington last week. But they're extremely well coached on both sides of the football Um will probably struggle with some of the Arizona State size on the offensive and defensive lines, but they have skill guys, two really good cornerbacks that can cover just about anybody. So they're a tough, well-coached football team who will not make mistakes to beat themselves. Yeah, and Arizona State is beat up. I don't know if you've heard or seen the the latest reports. Jalen Jalen Conyers, the the big tight end, the Oklahoma transfer, who's pretty dynamic. He's out. Uh, to Carlos Brooks from Chandler High School. I think he played with Mikey Keene. He's a fullback. He's out. Uh, I think both their tackles look like aren't trending. Uh, well, one one one's out for the year after an injury last week. So you know this Fresno State team worries me a lot i think the arizona state defense is pretty good but um do, do you see a jump there in in mikey was some of that just kind of like like nerves getting out of the way uh and, and and coming home could could we expect a big game from him yeah i mean he balled out against purdue i mean no no other way to put it i didn't know what to expect you know a lot of new weapons Hadn't, hadn't been in the system very long. Now, Purdue's very simplistic on defense. They play man coverage. So you know what you're getting every single stat snap. So it's easy to game plan. It's easier for the quarterback to know where to go with the football because he knows what the coverage is. He struggled a little bit against Eastern Washington. He was inaccurate through a really bad interception. He got picked against Purdue, but it was an excellent play by the free safety. But he he's a guy who... He beat Florida at the Swamp when he was with Central Florida. He was 23-0 and as a starter in high school, but he's not a guy who is phased by anything. He does not lose his cool. He's poised all the time, and you know he's mentioned a couple times that the hometown squad did not recruit him out of high school, and he has not forgotten that. So I think you're going to see the absolute best version of Mikey Keene on Saturday night. Yeah, I saw a quote from him at practice after practice the other day, and somebody asked about, you know, not being recruited by ASU. Do you see this as, you know, coming back and just proving, hey, like, you didn't recruit me, so here you go. Here's a here's a loss for you. Like, obviously, chip on his shoulder. 100%. I mean, 100%. I When I was in Chicago every year, like, I was on the verge of getting cut, and, and I said, okay, if I get cut, I want to go right to Green Bay because I want to come back and – beat down the Chicago Bears and I know that's the mentality that Mikey Keene has this week you know they went on the road and beat I don't know how good Purdue's going to be they beat Virginia Tech last week so they may be okay uh, they played at a very high level and that they did not reach that level against Eastern Washington home opener it was sold out but they did not play sharp at all I really think that you know, Jeff Tedford was very unhappy with their performance. I know how they work during the week. I, I really think that, yes, Mikey Keene is going to be gunning for Arizona State, but I really do think this Fresno State football team is going to be ready to go Saturday night. How would you describe just the way that Jeff Tedford has been able to come back and make such a huge impact immediately after, you know, taking that year off and just coming back? And it's been insane to watch. Yeah, he the job that he did when he took over a one and eleven football program and turned them into a ten win team. I one of the most impressive things I've ever witnessed. This program was in the dumps. 
they were not playing inspired football. They weren't well coached. They got beat up by teams that they should not get, you know, beaten by in, in very bad ways. And, and Jeff came in and totally flipped it and then had to step away for health issues. Kalen DeBoer stepped right in and we see what Kalen DeBoer is doing at Washington. Now he is a fantastic football coach. And then Jeff came back and kind of picked up where he left off. Kalen left a lot. You know, Jay Kaner was here. All those weapons were here. And Jeff just continued. Now, he brought back the defensive staff that Fresno State has. is as good as any program on the West Coast. Kevin Coyle, defensive coordinator, 15, 18 years in the NFL. Tim Skipper, who's an alum of Fresno State, will probably be the next coach, head coach, when, when Jeff Tepford departs. Jethro Franklin, same thing, a decade in the NFL. J.D. Williams, first-round draft pick for the Buffalo Bills. I mean, the the experience, not just playing, but coaching at the highest level on this defensive staff. I'm, I'm telling you, they're as good as anybody, and Jeff did a fantastic job. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he got all these guys back here, but he, he, he did an awesome job getting all of this experience back and, you know, Played a little below their level last week, but I expect them to play like they did against Purdue on Saturday night. Yeah, and they call Tedford the quarterback whisperer. So what do you think, you know, he's going to be able to get out of uh, Mikey Keene, and what's that potential like? You know, I mean, Mikey Keene's not the biggest guy, probably why he wasn't recruited by the Pac-12. You know, I think he's list listed at 5'11", maybe. I don't know. I don't think so. He's, he may be close, but, you know, that's probably why he's not a Pac-12 quarterback. But you look at his skill set, accuracy, uh, ability really to process information when he's under pressure. He doesn't leave the pocket. He takes big shots. He stands in there and throws them, and they're on point. So, you know, Jeff, I think, took a guy who's a competitor, who, you know, doesn't get phased by big moments. It's so it's so easy to throw great balls in practice, but when the pressure's on, can you stay calm? Can you be that, that voice in the huddle that calms everybody else around you? That's what Mikey Keene has. Now, Jeff Tedford has added some fundamentals. Uh, he's worked on processing, processing information. And he works on the things that you know, quarterbacks don't always get in high school and takes them to a level to where they're ready to go play in the NFL. I don't know if Mikey King's going to be that type of guy, but, you know, Jay Kaner was extremely accurate with the football, and Mikey King has a lot of those same traits, can throw into tight windows, can uh, anticipate where receivers are going to be open and throw the ball to them to help them get into space. Uh, he He's really polished as uh, a quarterback that can process a lot of information when he's under pressure in the pocket. Well, and, and what do you see this game coming down to on Saturday night now that uh, the injury reports come out here and Arizona State offensively is going to be piecing it together, it seems like. Can can the Bulldogs, against a good Arizona State defense, you think put up some points? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the question with this Fresno State offense, it was a question against Purdue, Eastern Washington as well. Can they protect against – you know, power five athletes, can they protect when the defense wants to send a little bit of extra pressure? Eastern Washington got pressure on Mikey Keene on Saturday night. Purdue got pressure with four guys, which, you know, if you have five guys blocking and a running back, you never want pressure with four guys. That's a problem. And, and they struggled both in their first two games protecting Mikey Keene. Arizona State can get after the quarterback and really affect this offense's ability. I think uh, you know, Malik Sherrod went down week one, who was the week one starter at running back. Um, Devin Rivers, who's a true freshman, got a little run last week. Uh, Elijah Gilliam is a 225-pound running back. He's a walk-on, but really good skill set. Can make you miss, is elusive, runs with power, can catch the ball out of the backfield, is a good pass protector. So if they can get a little bit of a running game going, which is a big if, I really don't know if they can. They did get a little bit going against Purdue, but, you know, Purdue's big and slow. <laughs> you know, Arizona State's defense is not slow at all. So we'll see. If they can get a running game going, then I think it takes the pressure off of that offensive line to protect in obvious passing situations. If they're in third and long all night, man, 
it's going to be it's going to be tough for this Fresno State offense to move the football outside of Mikey Keene playing a really, really exceptional football game. And let's not forget uh, 2018 when Fresno State actually beat ASU in the uh, Las Vegas Bowl. Uh, that was with Marcus McMarion, though. Ronnie Rivers went off that game. That was pretty exciting. And then, of course, different coaching staff, though, with ASU. Obviously, Herm Edwards is no longer here, but um, that was interesting. But, Cam, do you think that the Bulldog fan base will be traveling well over here? You know the red wave they, they always show up uh yeah the, the, i don't know how many fans will make the trip to arizona i've talked to a lot of people that are are going to get out there um i don't know how many tickets were available i i would guess three thousand to five thousand fans maybe will make it out there what is the stadium hold maybe 50 or 60. yeah, yeah. it's uh it's just about 50 since they've redone it i don't know if you did you play there in the nfl at all I did, yeah, a long time ago, way before the renovations, yeah. Well, I know back then um, that, that the, the, the stadium, you know, wasn't always full on Sundays because of the heat, and um, and now there's, a, there's some heat on the athletic director, so if Fresno State fans are coming out there, uh, there will likely be tickets available uh, on Saturday, especially as kind of all this injury news, um, uh, you know, rolls in here. But uh, but back back to your playing career. What when was that? What was the um, what was the game you played against the Cardinals? If we're right by the video library, we could go dig it up. <laughs> uh, it was it was actually a preseason game in 2003. Oh God, was it 190 degrees? You know, I, I don't remember. Uh, it was week three, so I think it was a little bit more mild and. Uh, I'm a Fresno guy, so, you know, it's it's hot in Fresno, too. Not Phoenix hot, but, you know, 5 to 10 degrees cooler. If it's 120 in Phoenix, it's 110 in Fresno. It's still hot. Uh, but really my first starstruck moment of my NFL career, because I had been with the Bears. We played two preseason games to start the season. But as I'm running off the field, getting ready to play the Cardinals after pregame warm-up, I run right by Emmett Smith. And... <laughs> I mean, I was a running back growing up. I grew up watching Emmett Smith, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's Emmett Smith. I told our strength coach, e that, that's Emmett Smith. He's like, so what? Like, get ready to play a football game. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. But, you know, you see Emmett Smith, someone that you idolized growing up, ended his career with Arizona. It was, uh, yeah, it was a surreal moment, to say the least. <laughs> and he, so Cam is a Chowchilla celebrity basically he comes from Chowchilla it's a tiny little town yeah. in Central Valley and then he goes to Fresno State plays at Fresno State and then he goes to the NFL like seriously that's such a cool story that your journey has taken you you know here it was fun man it was a fun ride I was in Chowchilla last week actually uh the hometown we're gonna put one of their games on TV this year so Chowchilla Dos Palos next Friday uh which is always fun um yeah you know I love running into people in Chowchilla because, uh, you know, I was a walk on at Fresno State. I was undrafted in the NFL and I just worked hard. That's it. That's all I did was work hard. And I think so many people in the Central Valley can relate to that. Like if you are successful in the Central Valley, it's because you work hard. You know that you're you're in agriculture or you really work hard at what you do. And people, I think, just relate to the way that I played the game and, and the path that I that I traveled and when I get to see people who, you know, maybe my path was a little bit of an inspiration to them, go back and talk to Chowchilla high school kids, which I try to do like once a year. It's just cool. It's cool to see uh, the, the, the path that I, you know, have traveled inspire people in some way and Central Valley people, you know, Julia, it, it, they love you. They'll always love you. They'll always remember you. And, and, and that's how it is around the Central Valley for me. Oh, I love it. Yeah, just people are so friendly, so nice, so supportive over there. It's a great little town. And and Julia was actually showing me some video of your playing career here. <laughs> um, now, look, you made it to the NFL. I mean, that is a, a monumental accomplishment. And I would look at this as a feather in my cap because my kids, you know, they're, they're playing and, and they're like, oh, he got mossed. He got mossed. Um, you actually, like, got mossed by Randy Moss. Like, that's... That's twice. amazing. <laughs> yeah, twice in the same <laughs> game too, where in the year that the Patriots went undefeated and they it was 42 to 7 at halftime. Let me tell you that. The worst half of football I ever played in by far. And yeah, the first one 
he kind of pushed me out of the way. So it wasn't like the true definition of getting Moss. So it's it pass still, interference, obviously. I mean, it kind of was, but Randy Moss is never going to get called for that. <laughs> it's still on his highlight tape. If they show the, the top 10, that, that one's on there. But the, the second one was like the absolute epitome of getting Moss. Even like when he took a release off the line of scrimmage, I was a two, I knew exactly where he was going and I was in perfect position. And when I was sitting there, I thought there's no way that Tom Brady's going to throw this ball because it's going to be an interception. And he reached back and launched it. And I thought, this is a pick. Like this is an interception. I go up, hands are on the ball. My hands were on the ball. And then something hits me in the back of the head. I land on the ground, and if you watch the, the highlight, like you see me whip my head around, and I see Randy Moss standing behind me celebrating in the end zone. And after the game, I had I don't know how many texts from like former teammates in Chicago or former teammates from <laughs> Fresno State, like, man, we saw you get Moss, and it was nasty. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I never got Moss by anybody not named Randy Moss. That's the one thing I can't say. I got, at least it was the guy that they named it after that got me. But my grandma was at that game. No lie, my grandma made a shirt that said I got mossed with the date on it and gave them to my family members. That's, that's how memorable of a moment that was. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, are you in that there's, there's the song of like the guy made with Randy Moss. It's like one clap, two claps, three claps. You know what I'm talking about? Are you in, are you, you're in that video? Getting oh, royalties? No, I don't know, but I got to check it out. Yeah. My daughter was like, you should start, you should create a I Got Moss fan club and start branding stuff and selling it because I think people would people would love that. Like, hey, every year, right around the Super Bowl too, Randy Moss's birthday. Last year it was on Super Bowl Sunday, which is not played in the Super Bowl with the Bears and lost to Peyton Manning. So it's not the greatest day uh, for me. I wake up that Sunday morning last year with texts from everybody like, bro, turn on sports center it's randy moss's birthday and they're playing his top five and you're number two and i was like dang this is a bad enough day <laughs> watching the super bowl remembering the loss but now i gotta wake up to get mossed all day long well what was what was the super bowl experience like i mean that would that it rained i think it rained the entire game there but just the the experience of getting to do that was that was that the highlight of the career besides the 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 result yeah i mean Probably went in the NFC Championship with the Bears. Um, it was it was year four for me, and we kind of had a nucleus of guys who most of us had been there for you know the whole time I was there. You know, Erlacher and Mike Brown and and Rex from and, Suaro High School in Scottsdale. Mike Brown, yeah, Arizona <laughs> native, yeah, for sure. Uh, Tank Johnson, uh, yeah, another guy. Yep, yep. another guy, uh, Bobby Wade. Yeah. You know? oh, oh, they're all Arizona guys. Tank Johnson was McClintock. Bobby Wade. Oh God. He went to U of A. Where'd he go to high school? I think he went in Ahwatukee. I think he's from Desert Vista, but that's, wow. I'm digressing here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but that nucleus of guys, we had kind of been together and, and I mean, we loved each other. We had such a blast playing football together and we just kind of best defense in the NFL that year. Erlacher is an absolute beast and it all just kind of came together and, we beat the Saints 39-17 or something at Soldier Field in the snow in January. It was, you know, the most fun I've ever had playing football. My whole family was out. We went to dinner afterwards. It was just a, it, it was a joyous occasion. And the Super Bowl too, but my family still talk about it. It was in Miami. It was the, the halftime that Prince performed. So like the most memorable halftime, still probably the greatest halftime show ever. They talk about it all the time. I have no idea. I've never watched it. I will never watch it. Uh, but th just the experience, being able to play, somebody like Hall of Fame players never get the opportunity to play in a Super Bowl. And, you know, Devin Hester takes the opening kickoff back. I run down and make a kick, a tackle on the, the ensuing kickoff and, you know, like I'm on cloud 15, not even cloud nine. Like I don't, I couldn't get high to get some oxygen. Cause I was just so like excited with all of the energy that existed and starting the game wet that way, you know, Peyton Manning played well. Uh, we busted a couple coverages and gave up a pick six. That's really why we lost. We lost by 12, I think, but man, such a fun run, such a great group of guys that I play with guys that I still keep in touch with to today.
Brian Urlacher lives in Arizona now. He's a Scottsdale guy now. So yeah, his son plays at Chandler. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Going to Notre Dame, right? So. Yeah, the the, yeah. the Arizona foot. We could just do a high school football podcast of where do guys go? <laughs> get you out here. We need to get you out here in studio at some point. Um, I am curious. What is the highlight of your NFL career? Do you have like a do you have like an interception that's in the book? Is there another picture on the wall? Like what's at the tackle in the Super Bowl? Is that the is that the the pinnacle? Nah, probably. Uh, I mean, I sacked Brett Favre, and at the time, I think it was the end of two thousand six. At the time we thought it could potentially be the end of Brett Favre's career he ended up playing like eight more. I actually was teammates with them with the jets. No uh, he played a long time after that. Now that was probably it. Cause it's a great picture. He's kind of diving out of the way and I was trying to really knock his head off. Uh, so that's probably the, the, the best picture from my playing days, tossing Heinz Ward around who I'm not a fan of at all, uh, was another good one. Um, but yeah, you know, days in Chicago, um, having success there and, and feeling the love from the, the city of Chicago, probably the highlight for me. Uh, you know, I was a backup special teamer, finally got to start, uh, in Miami, which was cool. But, um, you know, Chicago is another blue collar city and, you know, I just seemed to fit well with the, with the people of Chicago. Was that at Lambeau when you, uh, were able to get to Favre? It was at Soldier Field. Oh, and we, nice. we, we had clinched. Yeah, we had clinched. So, uh, last game of the season, we actually lost, but it didn't matter. We were the one seed. And oh, we that's were just right. Lose control. That's when uh, Sexy Rexy had some turnover issues, if if, uh, if if memory serves. He said that he didn't study for the game, which he probably shouldn't have said. Like, none of us did because it was over, right? We were 13 and two, and nothing mattered. We were the one seed already. Mike Brown threw a uh, our, our, our threw the greatest New Year's Eve, it was New Year's Eve, greatest New Year's Eve party I've ever participated in by far that night. That's what everybody was, was getting ready for while we were playing that game. <laughs> it was all cold at Soldier Field. Like, yeah, let's wrap this up on Sunday night football. <laughs> and we, we partied and we were at an area in Chicago where cabs don't show up mm. and it was freezing outside, walked outside, had no ride. Luckily, Mike Brown had a car and had two seats. My wife and I ran in and, and got back downtown because it was like eight degrees at, at two o'clock in the morning. It was not a place to be. Oh, my gosh. You should write a book. All right. Well, <laughs> um, one, one more question and we'll get you out of here. I guess uh, prediction for, for Saturday night at Sun Devil, or not Sun Devil Stadium. It's now Mountain America Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> do, uh, do you see a Bulldog victory here or do the Sun Devils hold serve? Nah, I see a Fresno State victory. Um, you know, Arizona State has some weapons. They, they're really tough defensively. They're, they're fast. They played physical. You know, they played a really emotional game against Oklahoma State last Saturday. They, they played really, really hard. It's so hard to replicate that from week to week, especially when you lose guys, you lose the game. I just, I don't think that Fresno State means as much to Arizona State as Oklahoma State coming in does but for fresno state arizona state is the biggest game on their schedule this year so i think you're going to see the best version of fresno state uh on saturday you know if they can get off the field on third down they wore down a little bit against Easter washington but if they can get off the field on third down you know, that defense stays fresh they're really really tough i know that arizona state offense is just beat up you know we'll see i think they can move the football against this arizona state defense but, you know, they're good. They're big and physical. But I, I think Mikey Keene's going to make enough plays. If if it's a toss-up, which I feel like this game is, I'm putting my money on Mikey Keene because he's more experienced. I think he's a better throw over the football. I don't know who's going to play for Arizona State, Rashada or the, the transfer. I, I think it's going to be Pine. That's just that's just what, I, what I've been able to read the tea leaves. I think Drew Pine, the Notre Dame transfer, is going to play this week. But I don't know his offense. The, the, the top six offensive linemen are either out or banged up. So, yeah, well, Kevin Boyle is going to have a field day with that. He's going to do a lot of things. He's going to twist up front. He's going to make those offensive linemen pass blocks off to protect the quarterback. He does a really good job of doing that. He'll bring pressure from different areas of the football field. It's it's really tough to be an inexperienced quarterback playing against the Kevin Boyle defense. Is Brooks now Keen's favorite target? Is that his go-to guy? 
I think it's Pat McCann, the OC. I think it's his favorite target. I think it's Mikey Keene's favorite target. He's just, you know, he's very quick. He has really good long speed too, but he just, he finds ways to get open, whether it's man coverage and using some leverage to be the defender or in zone, he just is able to find open areas in the middle of the football field. Trey Watson, a New Mexico guy, I always think he's from Arizona, but he's not, he's from New Mexico. Trey Watson, I've been waiting for him to show up for the three seasons he's been here and he's finally showed up making tough catches over the middle of the field. He's kind of that security blanket uh, when they need third and six or third and eight or in the red zone, he's kind of the guy, but yeah, they, they, they're going to game plan a lot of things for Eric Brooks. They're going to game plan a lot of things for Jalen Gill, who's can run it, runs the jet sweep game, very quick, explosive, uh, their returner. Uh, they have some guys that, that do have some explosive ability, but yeah, if if I'm game planning for this Fresno State offense, Eric Brooks is not beating me. Somebody else is going to have to beat me because he is their go-to guy. And he's not the biggest guy, Mark. He's uh, yeah. What, what, how how tall is he? You think? Five. Uh, he's listed at five seven. I think he's legit five seven. I think they're telling the truth. Maybe one seventy five or so. But former walk on waited. You know, he was behind a bunch of NFL receivers who are gone now. Waited his time to be the guy in the first two games he really has shown up. He's works extremely hard, extremely intelligent, does a really good job leading this very young receiving core. And I mean, he showed up against UCLA and USC. Those are the two biggest games before this year, balled out against Purdue. He'll be ready to go on Saturday night. All right. So you got a little running back, a uh, little, little receiver, big running back and a guy coming home that has a lot to prove. So I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this Fresno state team. So yeah, I am too. <laughs> uh, and I second, I second uh, your vote here. We need to get you on like uh, CBS NFL Sundays, man. This has been a great conversation. Yeah. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us here. Yeah. Any, anytime, man. I love, uh, uh, love catching up with you, Julia. I love when Fresno State goes and plays, you know, like power five opponents who have things like this that we can we can talk about football. It's always a blast. Appreciate the kind words. Um, I do this to have fun. I love Fresno State. I love football. I get to stay around the game and not coach, which I don't want that, that grind, but I enjoy it. So uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on for sure. Well, awesome. Well, next time you're out here, you got a place right here in studio. Absolutely. You got to come on the extra points. The TV show. <laughs> I'll be there. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, have a great night. Appreciate the time. Of course. Anytime. That was perfect. That was. Yeah. Do you want to take us out? <laughs> oh, you, no, you can. Sure? Yep. You haven't done one no, yet. No, because you started it. I know, but so it'll be more fun if you do it. I think we should put this part on, too. <laughs> the Extra Point Podcast is a production of 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona.